we can do too badly yesterday. Um, okay, um, so what I decided to do, I, I restructured what I was going to present based on conversation yesterday. And again, same story, please interrupt, uh, raise your hands, yell, uh, it should be two way street, okay? Um, so yesterday, uh, there was a question about genome wide association study. And what I realized that uh, some of you are not familiar with the general methodology of genome wide association studies and what, what we're getting out of those. Uh, we're not working on any methodological development right now, right? So, what I decided to do, I just included all the versions of almost teaching slides, so we'll introductory. Um, introductory remarks about, about GWAS. I wouldn't talk about linkage methods, so those, those of you who study classical genetics and know about linkage studies, about mapping using pedigrees, uh, I will not talk about that. So I will talk about three things, and there will be some disconnect. So we'll talk about association studies, we'll talk about random variant sequencing studies very briefly. Again, if there is an interest in mathematical details, there are questions I always can jump to the whiteboard. Uh, and then we switch gears because a few people were very interested in Mendelian genetics. Uh, trying to figure out whether most of those people are still here. Um, and in any bio new work. Uh, so I will switch to Mendelian genetics, but this will be almost a research talk. So that stuff is very new, almost unpublished, so there will be difference between the parts. So the reason I decided to talk about gene mapping before talking about the function, because we'll be discussing applications of function prediction into genetics and it will be very hard to do it without understanding of, of GWAS and without understanding programming steps. Okay? Shall we go? Good. Uh, so I'll start with genetic by association. And uh, the whole idea of gene mapping by association is the, the conceptual idea is very simple. Uh, it's much simpler than classic linkage, much simpler than many other variants of, of gene mapping. Right, so the idea is oops, uh, that if I have, for example, my disease cohorts and I have controls, and I'm looking at certain variants, I can detect variants or alleles that are more common in one group versus the other. So in this case, more common in the disease group than in controls. It's as simple as that, right? So if I detect that this allele is more common in the disease group than in controls, then probably this variant is causally implicated in disease, right? So it's causally involved in disease. Uh, if my phenotype is quantitative, like height of blood pressure, what I can do, I can run linear regression, and regression is of phenotype on genotype. Uh, now, the classic model is linear dosage, so I regress on dose of risk of ED. Uh, and you will ask me why there's no dominance, why there are no interactions with other loci, and the truth of the matter, nobody can find any. There is a recent publication out of um, the Niels lab and, and the others uh, suggesting that signal for dominance is, is uh, near zero in general association studies. Same story. <coughs> Um, there is, I think, a recent preprint from um, uh, Suram, uh, Romanian lab at UCLA. So same thing. So they feed pretty complex models, and they, they cannot find any evidence for additional variance, additional signal due to dominance. So people always pick linear models. So this is all very simple, right? The problem is that the variants are not independent. Uh, imagine that there is. Uh, an organ which is a section. So I have bacterial genetics or I have cancer genetics in, in some other extent, right? I cannot map anything by association because I find this variant and every other variant in the genome <coughs> will be fully correlated to this, uh, to, to, to this variant, right? Because there is no recommendation. <laughs> so in gene mapping by association, the same story as a linkage, recombination provides, provides you a scale. Recombination provides you positional information. So what you're learning, you're learning positional information about the variant. You're testing for presence of the allele. You're not testing for the position. In a, in a classic linkage test, you're testing for the position. You're testing for presence of the allele. But in reality, what you're getting, you're getting positional information. And recombination, recombination history in the population is the mechanism that provides you with, the, with, the, with information. Okay. I'm looking at the occupational expression, and I think it doesn't make any sense what I'm saying. 
So let's try to do this. So we'll talk about linkage of equilibrium. I mentioned it multiple times yesterday. We'll come back and we'll see if it starts making sense. If it doesn't, then models will stop and discuss. So this is, this is the key point here. So why are variants non-independent? So we discussed Kalesson kind of genealogies, and if I see genealogy here, right, I, I may have multiple variants. So you remember this, right? So time goes backwards, this is my sample, and this is my history of the sample. That's my genealogical tree, or Kalesson's tree. And these are different mutations in the logs. So these mutations may be in different positions, but in the absence of recombination event, these variants are fully dependent. <coughs> and this is what we call linkages equilibrium. You can think of linkages equilibrium as just covariance between genotypes along the genome. So for example, historically, in my original population, I was segregating this variant. So there is a, a, a large and a, a small. And at a certain point, they accumulate a new mutation. Right? So for example, in this locus B, I accumulate B small. Now see what's happening, right? So B small is linked to A large. Out of all four possible combinations, I can have A large, B large, A large, B small, A small, B, uh, B large, and A small, B small. I never observed this one. A small, B small is never observed. So this, this, this event, introduction of new mutation, creates correlation structure in the data. I need a recombination event to break this correlation. Uh, so, same story, different slide. I have individual chromosome like this, so I have a de novo mutation event. And this is my mutation, and this is my marker or my other, other variant. And with time go, going forward, if this variant increases in frequency, recombination starts chopping up this, this block. So size of this haplotype that is linked to this variant is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, progressively shorter, right? So I'm breaking this correlation now. If I wait for long, uh, long enough, the correlation will be completely broken. Again, recombination is the force that, 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 that breaks it. Now, we, we have several measures. So the original measure was uh, suggested by Dick Watson, who unfortunately passed away last year. Um, this measure was Covariance between genotypes, so this is expected frequency of the haplotype, uh, sorry, observed frequency of the haplotype minus expected frequency uh, in, and under the hypothesis of linear independence. Uh, usually, uh, it's convenient to use measure D prime that normalizes by the, uh, <clears throat> by the greatest possible D under. Um, uh, the uh, given the frequencies, right? So basically, what the prime measures is whether the, 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 the uh, haplotypes are completely linked or they're broken, right? In, in, in the case of complete uh, complete equilibrium at zero, in case of complete linkage, is not. And there is correlation coefficients. Now the correlation coefficients are squared, so I can run correlation coefficient between the two uh, uh, two sides. And what happens just to provide you intuition if Every combination has 25% uh, on each frequency, right? This is a total equilibrium. I observe all four combinations at, at the same frequency. The frequency is 50% and 50% for alleles, and for haplotypes is 25%. My D prime is zero, R squared is zero. Now, if there is shift from the balance, right here there, is, there are clearly dependencies. Now I generate D prime and R squared somewhere in the middle range. Here, See what's happening. There is full linkage. I never observed for haplotype. But they are not fully balanced. So R square is not one, but D prime is one because it, it, I, there is no single recombination event here. And here, of course, it's called complete tagging. So if this is the problem with associations, right? Because if I measure association on this, on this side and I measure association on this side, I get identical information. There is no way in the world I can figure out which side is actually causing, causing, causing my phenotype, right, by running the association test. So that's, that's, that's the issue with linkages equilibrium. 
Now, people frequently draw the pictures of haplotypes. Uh, I have the sequence. And I have my risk SNP. For example, my risk SNP is this. Right, so this is where, where the action is. This is my, my, my variant associated with my trait. Now here, I have a perfect proxy. So this guy tags this identically. Right, so there's no information gain. There's no statistical method where I write, which I can use to tell me that this is actually a functional variant rather than this one. And then there is a tag SNP. So this variant sits within this other type. Right, so it's tagging. And there is enough correlation here that if I find correlation with C, right, I know it would probably be with, with G here rather than C. Okay? So I'm running a bunch, bunch of independent tests, but in reality I'm running dependent tests. And the, the issue is that if I have very tight correlation structure, I cannot resolve. Um, I cannot resolve the, the, the method. So this is why none of these methods work in asexual systems, right? In, in getting bacteria, in, in somatic variation in cancer, nothing, nothing works like this. Gene mapping fundamentally doesn't work. Okay, so if I look at the frequency, <laughs> change of frequency VLE, yeah, I think I'd like this to sync, so this is why I'm showing the same story from most volumes, okay? Um, this is change in allele frequency, so I, I introduce the mutation, it goes up in frequency. In my D prime here, right, I have all of this region left. But even though I have all this regional length, the power of association test, so if I would run regression, this is a little bit subtle, um, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult to see, uh, I don't think we have time for, for, for real derivation, but if, what matters, the correlation matters for, for confusing my association result. Uh, because this haplotype is totally leaked, so I cannot distinguish my mutation from any, anything else in this block. However, my lead frequency is very low, right? So I have no power to do the type of association. Then it starts being broken, and the region which is completely linked uh, becomes narrow and narrow. However, in terms of R square, my region with high R square actually go uh, it actually becomes wider because R square also has frequency information in it, and, and I and I increase frequency, right? So I increase correlation. If you run correlation and something is very rare, even 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 if perfect perfectly tagging, correlation is still low. Okay, this idea is, is, is clear, right? So the idea, like at least non-mathematical version of, of, of linkages equilibrium is understandable. So, we have history of the population, and that's basically insufficient amount of recommendation for our population history. Now, traditionally, genome-wide association studies and we're, we're now increasingly moving towards sequencing data. We're in this weird um, time where most of studies are still genotyping microarrays studies. So I'll talk about genotyping microarrays. Those are all, uh, those are, those are all slides. I see some people disapproving. Uh, I would insist that still most of the data we have are genotyping microarrays studies, but sequencing very rapidly catches up. Right? And we'll talk, about, we'll talk about how sequencing catches up. Um, Okay, in terms of the in terms of the uh, microarray studies, so what's happening is I take my population and I measure frequencies of uh, of, of variants. So yeah, I sequence some number of individuals. I know the site is polymorphic, and I can use this cheap technology to to go to a much larger population and genotype. So everybody is a heterozygote at the site, uh, or homozygote, or the other the other homozygote lead, right? So people can be in this case. GG, TT, or GT genotype, and I can identify this for every, for every person. Now what I'm doing, this is called marker because I don't know whether this variant is involved in my phenotype or it's not involved. What I'm hoping, I'm hoping that the causative variant uh, is, is linked to this, so it's, it's highly correlated, and when I find this association, I actually, I'm actually it points to location of the causative variant. Right? And the only reason you can point to location is because LD extends certain distance and doesn't extend long distances. Uh, okay, so this is the study design. Now, what's, before we go forward, maybe I would, uh, you didn't say anything, but I watched, uh, 
you're, you're nodding and disapproving, so I can, I can give you a quick comment. So, what's happening is initially in the study design, LD was a, was a blessing because if you want to use microarray technology, right? Microarray technology doesn't give you the full, uh, all, the, all the variation. So you have a chance to find the locus without typing every single step. Now with the sequencing data, LD is actually occurs because what we're interested in, we're interested in the functional variant, and we'll talk in the, the, the later today where we'll talk about functional variants and predicting and, and finding functional variation. And you cannot find a functional variant, right, because Again, statistically, all of this group is highly correlated with each other. There is emergence of new statistical techniques that I'll only mention in passing, or again if there are questions, which is called fine mapping. Can I use this correlation structure, carefully model it, to predict which variant actually provides, provides the signal? Okay? Okay, any questions here, or I move to uh, to do mathematics behind uh, behind your boss. I'm going now, no, no one else can. I think I'm going. Well, why is it difficult? So it seems that it's a very simple proposition. I just measure regression at every side, right? Uh, and then I find my loss side. The problem is that there is structure in the data, so it's not only that variants are correlated with each other. Individuals in the population are correlated with each other. Also, uh, we sometimes have normal genotypes, there is technical variation, there is hidden relatedness, which is another way of saying individuals are correlated with each other. Right? But most, most problem is here. So the, uh, the reason this is a problem, so we discussed yesterday that bulk of common genetic variation is shared across population. However, frequencies are not exactly the same. So what's happening is, if I'm looking at one population, I'm trying to detect the signal, right, and my, my sample is actually mixed, the difference in frequency I will read out would be difference between population groups rather than difference between uh, individuals with different phenotype, right? So if I'm running a study of diabetes, uh, I can find difference between population groups rather than, than differences actually leading to diabetes. Uh, and that's the key insight here. So this is a correlated data structure. Uh, why is this a problem? And the problem is twofold. Uh, so one part of the problem is that if I have some environmental component correlated to, to, to ancestry, uh, so the classic example, if I would study fine water, like if, like maybe not here, but say in, 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 in Boston, we'd study uh, fine water skills, and the way we'll do it, we'll ask how well people can use chopsticks when, when they eat, right? And clearly what we'll find, we'll find all ancestry component, of, uh, all components of East, East Asian ancestry rather than fine water skills, right? So that's totally misleading. So this is in the situation where there is slight correlation between the environmental uh, effect and on, on the phenotype and, and the ancestry effect. And this induces correlation with the frequency, it's total normal. That's problem number one. There's problem number two. Problem number two happens when, the, when there is a real signal. And, and the way you think about it, you can think of population structure as uh, linkages equilibrium that is not localized. Right? So in the ideal world, all correlation structure stays within the locus, right? I have neighboring variants are highly correlated. I move, move out of the locus. This correlation breaks down. Imagine that I have a sample of individuals of, I don't know, South Asian ancestry and Native American ancestry. And there will be a bunch of frequencies in the sample, right? A bunch of alleles that have di slightly different frequencies between the two populations. When I look at the mixed sample, I would realize that I have a correlation because if I see variant uh, with higher frequency in Native American group in this locus, there is, a, there is information about possible frequency of another snake with higher frequency in, in, in Native Americans. Right? So I create correlation structure along the genome. I create LD along the genome. It's not localized anymore. 
I'm losing positional information. So what's happening in this, in this case? I would detect true association, but I would have another signal, maybe on a different chromosome, that reflects the same association, but it's completely <coughs> not real. Right? And I would have multiple of those. So what happens is that I have two correlation structures here to think about. One correlation structure is between variants, and another correlation structure is between individuals. And I have to take, take into account both of those. Okay, uh, what do we do? Uh, so the classic method, I think I removed uh, mathematics. How many people know what principal components are? Many do. So, so principal, okay, so, so the classic method, classic method to do it uh, is to use principal components. Uh, you can reduce dimensions, right? So you can take your whole group. You could run principal component analysis and you can plot uh, your samples and principal component analysis. So this is, I think, back in 2008, this is a picture, famous picture by John Lamember and others, uh, how uh, map of Europe. By the way, I, there was, yeah, Turkey is Europe according to the study. <laughs> I know it's politically from Canada, but, uh, <laughs> um, So you see, Turkey is here, right? So there is Greece and there is Balkans is here. And uh, I don't know, Portugal and Spain, the UK is here, Switzerland, Germany, France. So you basically have reconstruction of map of Europe uh, based on ancestry where people come from. Pretty accurately. Meaning that uh, genetics within Europe is determined by geography. It's pretty much determined by geography. <coughs> um, is it true for every single country? Or every single every single continent, what do you think? So the counterexample is India. And in India, what happens in India is that there are multiple populations, and due to religious reasons, due to due to uh, cultural uh, uh, effects, uh, genetic structure of the population is not fully explained by geography, right? So you cannot build the same picture in India. Uh, this is the principal components for Indian groups, and they are influenced by, you can map it across language, you can make, uh, map it across status, you can map it across religion, and, and so forth. Right? So there are many other possibilities in, in different populations. So what you do, you, you use principal components. More recently, people moved to mixed models. Uh, how are we doing on time? We're, uh, uh, so, so there is the, 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 uh, the ability to use the full Kevarian structure. I wanted to go real quick through mathematics of linear mixed models. I don't know if people care. Uh, do you care or, or, or are you got the, the main idea about population structure and you just skip it over? Okay. Just kidding. Good. No, no, no. no. no, no, no. no. Okay, so there is a disagreement. <laughs> okay, good. If there is disagreement, listen to this. I'll, I'll try to go quickly, right? If people would realize how boring it is, you just let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll skip anyway. Okay, and if, and if this is exciting, then maybe even, even people who are disapproving would be happy. Um, okay, so uh, the general idea of, of mixed models, uh, you know, maybe maybe I'll skip this, we'll just, we'll just do this for a second. So look, look what's happening. Uh, so because only half the people are so I'll, I'll try, I'll try to do it quicker, <laughs> like showing everyone else like. Um, so we have phenotype of individual I, right, so that's Y. And the simplest possible model is that this phenotype is given by non-genetic factors epsilon. That's just what we call environment. I don't know why it's called environment, it can be whatever, but it's, it's usually called environment. Uh, and it's, it's uh, locus effect, so we have J is index uh, of, of a locus. Beta is the type of the locus, and we multiply locus and that by genome. Now, the problem with association studies is that we fit markers individually. Why in the world we fit markers individually? The, the reason we fit markers individually is because there are two million of them. Right? So you cannot run a joint model. So what's, what's happening is we're saying, okay, so this is y, right? And, and y is determined by effect of locus 1, because this is what I'm measuring when I fit individually, right? So I'm trying to estimate by one. That's what I'm trying to do. And, and what I'm pretending when I do this test is this all other loci 
right? Behave like the Arab. They behave like the Arab Torah. And that's not right. Why is it not right? So people have said that they know this anyway. So why, why isn't this right? Because they are not independent. Right? Because different people have different proximity in genetic ancestry. Right? So this is not, this, this are not independent, in, in, independent events. Uh, so instead we can fit the model with this fixed effect. So this parameter is, is presumed to be fixed. And call this a random effect. Model on this correlation. So I'm saying that this still is an error term. It's a random term. However, unlike my true noise, which is assumed normally distributed, and independently, this, this is identity matrix. Right? So it's, it's the same, it's a normal distribution for every for every analysis. Uh, U, which is random effect, is multivariate normally distributed, and I keep the covariance. And this covariance is proportional, so exact, uh, there should be some, some scale over here. But it's proportional to genetic relations, uh, uh, relatedness matrix. And genetic relatedness matrix is, is a covariance matrix over genotypes, right? So that's literally X, X, T, X transpose. And it, it has the information about covariance structure. So if you have hidden relatedness, if you have population structure in the data, all of this technical stuff, all of this is going into, into this matrix, and you control and you control for level matrix here. Have you ever talked about using ultra regressive? Uh, so well first it's again we're we're not uh, covering uh, de development of this stuff. I'm not sure I never uh, I've never seen ultra regressive model used used in this setting, in this exact setting. I'm not sure it's going to work. We can discuss it maybe offline. So um, that doesn't seem to be a good idea. Uh, can't tell you right, 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 like off the top of my hand, but it, it, I'm not sure what you would do what you want, what you want to do. Right? Because what you want to do, you want to capture, you you, you want to run a regression on on a sample with a lot of correlations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, what, so what will happen, that's okay, that's, that's, that's an important thing. So what you're suggesting, you're saying that uh, because it's auto regressive, you're saying neighboring locus provides information here. J minus 1. J minus 1, exactly. So what I'm talking, now this is, this is uh, like correlation between loss size linkages and green green. I'm talking about correlation between individuals in the study. That's not localized. So you cannot say that, so the the distance between neighboring SNPs is not informative. The correlation between neighboring SNPs is not informative about correlation of individuals. Because correlation of individuals depends on every, every single marker here. Right? So I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, 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 it's going to work. So this works actually quite, quite well. Uh, at least people believe that we successfully correct for population structure, and there are some uh, bubbling questions sometimes about the data. Um, okay, so another idea in, in association study is uh, the idea of, of a p-value threshold. So what's important here is, so one thing, by the way, for, for those of you who are um, not in human genetics, all of this is frequencies inference, right? So we're just running standard frequencies tests. Uh, when we're running standard frequency tests, the object we're receiving is a p-value. Uh, but there are very many tests, right? Because we ran a lot of variables. So this means that I cannot just say use nominal big, uh, nominal uh, significance threshold. What I have to use is multiple test corrected, right? So why, what's the idea? The idea is if I'm running thousand tests, and if I would use five percent um, significance threshold, I will just have fifty that's right. I can complete now. I will get 50 signals, right? So that's not important. So I have to correct for how many signals I have run. That's a non-trivial question because my variants are correlated, right? So they are not independent. What the community does, and we can question wisdom of the community, okay, here, uh, but this is the standard in the field. So what people do? The standard idea in multiple test correction, the simplest idea is that if I have n tests, right, and my significance level is alpha, I'm writing the probability that out of n tests, I never see it. That's proportionally, that's approximately linear in sample size. 
So I can do the correction, which is my traditional correction divided by uh, by number of uh, by number of tests I run. That's called Bonferroni. That's called Bonferroni. Uh, and the problem is that the tests are dependent on the they depend on DVLD. Right? So, so Bonferroni is, is a wrong idea. Uh, what the community did is is it was determined that, that there is effective number of independent tests. And the human gene, this is very specific for human, right? It's, it's, it's the size of human, it's genetic size of human genetic variation, right? Only comma. In rare variation, it's a different threshold because this logic doesn't work anymore. So it turns out that the human genome has effectively one million common markers. So the accepted threshold, so the, the standard 5% threshold, turns out to be 5 to 10 minus 8. This works. Now, the major reason the community believes in this simple idea and nobody's working on, on more complex methods is because it's working. Uh, there is always a debate why we're not Bayesian, why people have computed p-values rather than base factors, right? Or, or like why, 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 why the world is not Bayesian because all statistics is Bayesian, Bayesian is one, why we're still using frequency statistics in, in genetics. Um, I, it's either inertia or, or just utility, right? So people understand p-values, people know how to act on p-values, people spend money and time following up the loci. P-value is very is a very easy guide. It's hard to uh, to deal with major statistics. Now I should tell you that in fine mapping, for example, <coughs> major statistics becomes very um, becomes quite acceptable. A lot of methods are Bayesian. I will talk today uh, later today about localization tests and again Bayesian statistics is what is is what useful. Okay, uh, very classic pictures you read in Joa's tests, right? So it's QQ plot, so quantile quantile plot. You look at expected versus um, expected p values versus observed p values, and the usually usually you, you want to see something like this. So there is no inflation in your statistics, uh, but there is a real signal deviating from the line, and that's that's multiple test correction. That's another way to, to present it. Now the problem with extreme polygenicity. Um, is that sometimes deviation happens very early because we're, we're talking about tens of thousands of signals and you need better methods to discriminate and methods like all this for regression and others there are, there are, there are more sophisticated techniques uh, to figure out whether this is inflation in the data or uh, this is a truly very high polygenic signal. And another type of plot you would always see is called the hand plot uh, and this is the p-value threshold, it's uh, 5, 10, minus 8, right, so that's called genome-wide significance. Every chromosome, and you're going along the genome, and you see that the reason it's called Manhattan plot. Uh, it's because you have uh, all of this skyscrapers here. Uh, why do you see multiple variants here at, at this, at each of those peaks? Why they are not isolated? What is it? Why do I see the shape? So if I see this variant, like I have a bunch of other variants with very similar p-values. They're condensing? What? They might have two same dependency on both sides. This is not biology, that's linkage is equilibrium. That's literally correlation structure in the data show shown in a different way. But because I have local linkage as equilibrium, I don't have a resolution, right? If I run individual tests, even if I correct for correlations in, 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 in the sample. But in this analysis, I don't correct for correlation between SNPs, right? So I don't run at a regressive model or something like that. So I usually, I always see correlated groups. And this is, so talking to people who believe it's all sequencing data, that, that, that's what we're doing most, frankly, at this point. It's very hard to figure out which variants are important. And again, we'll talk with the functional module today where we'll talk about this because uh, if I tell you that I have 150 kilobases of DNA and somewhere within this, there is a variant with a minuscule, minuscule effect size because I, I see the significant p-value by running tests of hundreds of thousands of individuals, right? So the effect size is very small. It's, a, it's very difficult to follow up. So, so the community is really 
that's a very hard open problem that we're going to discuss later today. And the reason I decided to swap the lectures is specifically for this. So you would realize how important the problem is. Right? Because I, I found loss associated with disease. If I go to sequencing data, I have every single variant. I can impute it. I truly don't even have to go into sequencing data. Uh, I still do not know which of these variants is causative or biologically important. Right? I, I just fundamentally don't. Okay, so we have about 20 minutes. Uh, I spoke yesterday, and again, I, I apologize, I didn't realize that uh, there will be the same audience for all the lectures, so the, the one was partially redundant. But uh, what I wanted to do, based on some conversations about UDN project, I wanted to expand this on rare disease. And I would not talk interesting stories for our patients and how individual genes were discovered. I will talk about methodology and I will talk about what we're doing right now. And I will use our study as an example, but I think it's an example of a broader, of a broader picture. And at the broader picture, sorry guys, I'm running ahead of myself. I'm running, I, 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 sorry, forgot everything. I will, I will repeat this again. Uh, I'm, it's, now you should realize I'm, I'm seven hours behind you, right? Uh, uh, okay, so uh, one, one important thing about associations and, and burden tests, and again we'll talk later today about functional predictions and how this is working. One issue with uh, association tests is that I can only study common variants. Right, so what's happening is that if I, if I have UK by bank size of the study have half a million individuals, but if I see the variant three times, right, there is zero chance to statistically relate it to anything. Right, zero, zero chance. I have five, I, I'm out of pocket. So what I can do, however, instead of testing, now this is an important proposition, instead of testing for frequency of each individual variant, I can develop a test that group all variation around some unit. This unit normally is a protein coding gene. Uh, people are trying to expand it. Uh, we had a, oh, we, uh, had a paper led by Jerome Lin's lab to the coding windows. We we're not sure how well it's going to work. We're now working into having a unit being a network or a pathway or multiple gene unit. But in standard way, it's, 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 a, it's a gene. And the reason it's a gene, it's, it's very powerful in protein coding regions because we know that there is uh, enrichment in rare variants of larger effects. So that's, that's what we discussed yesterday, right? So, so this is why protein coding regions is, is a very good place to look. Uh, what's important here is that now I, now I don't have markers, right? As soon as I'm combining variants per gene, they are not correlated by LD, some of them are, but my idea is that I want to look at the association collectively. And I break this notion that genetics is unbiased, right? I start using biology suddenly. Because what I know is that those variants that actually impact function of, of the gene provides all the signal. And those variants that are neutral or benign, they, they don't do anything. Right, so it's very important now to suddenly decide which variants I'm going to combine and how I'm going to combine. And there are many mathematical details how people do it. It's not very sophisticated, but there are, there are a bunch of ways to, uh, to do it. And again, we'll, we'll talk about this, this particular aspect later today. How does it look? Um, uh, relatively old story. We were involved in a study on LDL cholesterol. This is the classic Nobel Prize winning paper on the effect of LDL receptor on cholesterol level. Uh, and this shows that the effect is pretty sizable, it's 20 fold effect. You never see anything like that in, in common variation study, right? So you have to go into rare variants. Uh, and this is one of the examples in the lipids. Uh, this is a way 5 and I have LDLR exactly the same gene as. Um, identified uh, by traditional familial genetics. And this is how data look like. So this is about 24,000 chromosomes, right? And these are variants collectively in cases and controls. And what you observe here is that all these variants, even this ones, will never be significant on the background of the study. You can never, you can never find them alone. 
But when you clearly see that, especially if you take singletons, and especially if you look that some of those are clear loss of function variants, that collectively there are more very there's increased variation in cases compared to controls. And this is how you find the genes. Right? All of them are individually very rare. So that's called burden test or collapsing test. Um, and it, this is the example of LDLR, so this is the same classically identified genes, and these are only loss of function and frame shift variants. And these are cases and these are controls. And you see that the effect is very massive. But to find it by association, you need a very large number of individuals because you need many of these variants to give you statistical power. And if you look at actual LDL level, so I should say that this association is a microarmal infarction. And if I look at the LDL level, again, this is how it looks, right? So this same individuals, again, the association is on the disease status, not, not, on, not on, the, uh, on the measure of the biomarker, which is LDL. You see that for uh, disruptive loss of function mutations, LDL is, is much greater than for important missing mutations, and this LDL level is much greater, so you basically average for synonymous. Yeah. Right, so those that are not important for, uh, for the working function. And this is why we have to use some idea about the function in, 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 in constructing the test. Uh, and this reproduces the, the, the classic paper, the, the effect size. So that's pure association findings. So you just sequence some of people and, and running the test, and you're finding the same, uh, the same result. Okay, we'll talk about a little bit more. So there are three published studies across multiple phenotypes in the UK Biobank. And why people are interested in this test? People are interested in this test because it provides practical sense, direct road to therapeutic targets. So if you're a pharmaceutical company, right, so the classic work on, 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 on the defined target of, for therapeutics is uh, you're, you're finding a pathway, you have a gene, you're running a whole bunch of experiments, and then you follow these experiments, and then you look at the human genetics, and, and, and you're saying, oh, maybe, maybe this gene is important. Here, you are finding large effect variants with known directionality that work in humans, and you can measure all side effects in humans. So you genetically mimic the effect of the drug. Right? You have large effect, you have directional effect, and you know what happens. So, so there are a bunch of... Uh, the first example, I don't know how many of you heard about PCSK9, so this is an amazing gene which is drug target for heart disease now, and um, there are emerging new targets out of the studies, and, and that's much easier than working with non-coding genetic associations. So it's, 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 it's a funny situation, right? We're, we're in a situation where common non-coding association explains most of variation in, in disease risk, but rare variants are of great utility for any practical use of genetics. Okay. Now, I, yes? Can we use also this uh, burden test for a diagnostic test? As a diagnostic, as a diagnostic test, is, mm -hmm. this is a hard proposition. So, because these are not Mendelian phenotypes, these are complex phenotypes, uh, you're finding the effects, they are not, they are large, but they are not fully penetrant variants, right? So, you don't know whether the, the, like the information content is still relatively low, but the major issue is that there are very few, so if you go to, to, to this example, right? Look, these are 5,000 individuals. See how many have there. Right? So you find very small fraction uh, uh, with, with the variant. If it segregates in the family, then that's a different story, so maybe there are some utility and so forth. Um, there are some people who are saying we should reuse burden test and identify people at higher risk together with polygenic risk score. Um, that's probably true, uh, but currently none of that <coughs> is, is negative. Okay, any more questions here or moving to monogenic disease? I'm again running a little bit behind. Uh, so you'll see from slide formatting that's a different talk. That's actually a research talk uh, on, on, the, on the subject. Uh, and uh, I know there was at least one person involved in UDN, so I wanted to show to, the, to, to, to show this work in progress. So what's 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 this happening? Again, uh, this is the study I'll use as example. This is bioinformatics methods school, right? So I'm not really presenting one study. I'm presenting the methodology. I'm just using it as to start the example. 
So what's uh, again 12 sites uh, throughout the country. Uh, we have everybody's genome, uh, and we have currently. Uh, so this is the current number of probands. We, by the way, we always take on sparrows. This, you, you'll see why, right? So you always need parents. Like all of this is a story about trio sequencing. Sometimes one, sometimes six. Um, we've had historically great success in um, dominant condition sequencing remote relatives or siblings. So now I'm only talking about sporadic cases and, and, and uh, situations where we sequence trio. And the reason we do it because in a large study it's much easier to have standard, right? So to, they have the same type of data. The idea of the story, as I told you, is that we move rare disease genetics from individual patient, from group of patient, from family, to large data science and large cohorts. And it's surprising how well it works with very heterogeneous cohort, because in this case, again, in order to get into, into the problem, you have to be undiagnosed. Right? You don't have to be a neurological phenotype, or um, you don't have to be, I don't remember if I have, yeah, I, you don't, this is the split of phenotypes, right? So it's not study of, of, of all immune phenotypes. This is not study of uh, musculoskeletal genetics. This is study of everybody. Uh, and still, analyzing data jointly uh, provides a great value, this is my opinion. Uh, okay, so what we want to do, because we want to find genes that people didn't discover, we want to find signals people didn't discover. Uh, so we're going outside of classic uh, single nucleotide variants of indels in the working group I'm sharing here. It's uh, <coughs> my informatics working group called Tomb Building Condition Molecular Tribute Expansion Contraction. I'm not going to present that. And we'd like to find three different signals. So one is compelling mutations that arise de novo, recurring de novo mutations, strong candidate biologic variants, and also where we're trying to cluster genes by pathways and, uh, and, and, and networks. Okay, so what is a sporadic case? Again, we have healthy parents, nobody in the family shows, shows the phenotype, uh, the child shows the phenotype. Uh, one option is that this is a dominant condition and mutation happens de novo. Right? This is why uh, nobody had the phenotype. It's actually 1700 per whole genome in the coding regions where all the action is on average is one. Which is very good because if I find a de novo mutation and I have a good suspicion, it's already a pretty good lead. Right? Or it can be a recessive case. Right? It can be that one variant is uh, inherited from the mother, one from the father. They happen to be in the same gene. Uh, and usually what we see, in an overwhelming majority of cases, we see compound heterozygosity. Now, in some cases we see homozygosity, in our experience, um, at least in our local population of New England, uh, we've had families of Middle Eastern descent, or um, families uh, from groups like Patan, so they uh, in the state of Massachusetts, but they remain cultural traditions, or maybe they don't even keep the tradition, but at least in their uh, family history, uh, there are marriages of, of relatively close relatives, right? First cousins, second cousins, and so forth. Um, or we've, we had a patient whose um, grandparents came from two villages in Ireland 40 miles apart, and then she, she didn't know that uh, her parents are related, but if you look at the data, it's like 30 megabits block. Well, which is maybe four generations, five generations, but there is clearly relatedness um, in my right? Uh, so I'm not going to talk about these cases. Um, I'm very tangentially involved in some programs in the Middle East that focus on, on, on these exact cases, and I don't think there are any people involved in, in the audience. I know that in Turkey there is also excess of homozygous. Okay, so I'm focusing on either the novel or, or bilateral a situation of compound like I Now, what would be the method? So we're finding confident de novo variants. We call them, we call them with Bayesian method. So this is all the properties I showed the slide yesterday. We have the expected number of single nucleotide changes. We have expected number of indels. All distributions are clean, as expected uh, age when birth. You should run a lot of bioinformatics to call the novo mutations carefully. 
Uh, we wrote a method called nonpolar, which is a measuring method. Again, I'm not going to talk about that. It made huge difference. Uh, all of this, by the way, is very expensive because you run this on the cloud, and if, if, you, if you need, if you have to look at uh, original files on the data, that's number looking at that. Uh, so these are long, long and expensive projects. Uh, okay, then over there. So now we we adopted the method published by Sanyur and uh, Rambaud University and uh, Jim Diaz. It's called the Novo West. Well, and we equipped the method with the mutational model that I, uh, that I described yesterday. Uh, so it's much more accurate, in terms of, we hope it's much more accurate than applying true mutations to, to, to the Novo events and correcting for probabilities. So the method works the following way. Uh, so we have different functional classes of variance. Again, we'll talk about that later today. We have different measures, so the method relies on estimation of selection coefficient for loss of function. Uh, so important selective constraint, we published this in, I think in two papers, 2017, 2019, this metric was adopted by this group. So it, it looks at how likely the gene is going to cause autosomal dominant condition, and it looks at the functional prediction for the variant. Right? So that's number one. Uh, then we compute expected de novo, that's computed generally by simulations. And there is enrichment score. And enrichment score is run by missions because the idea is that if it's only for missions, it's not for nonsenses, and they are enriched in some region of the protein, this may be gain of function there. Right? So we have enrichment score and excess score. Uh, and when we run this, right, so, so now again this gives us a p-value, and p-value comes up from combining, from combination of two p-values and, and running, run, running simulations. Uh, this is how p-values, uh, these are known confirmed diagnosis, right? This is fraction of known confirmed diagnosis at low p-values and how, how, how much it drops. So you see that there is a lot of enrichment of true signal. And these are our hits. I frankly suspect that a couple of them are probably technical artifacts, which we'll try to follow up. But this is absolutely amazing. Now think what's happening. Consortium of 12 clinical sites has been running for at least six years now, maybe seven years. <coughs> uh, every patient was analyzed individually. The fact that in this gene, there are two patients having the known mutation, no, nobody knew, right? Because you have to run this in other ways, right? Because it just was not enough. Then what's happening is, right, so you see that in many cases the diagnosis is actually matching. But what's interesting is that as soon as you find these individuals, right, in these genes, you find that these two individuals and these two individuals have, are very similar clinically. So it's because we keep everybody's clinical, uh, clinical notes. So these are new findings, basically new genes for new diseases. Right? The beauty of this is that we never run extensive clinical variation, any biological experiments, right? There no nothing. It, we just press the bottom of statistical method, spits out this issue. Right? What do you have to do? You have to collect tens and hundreds of thousands of individuals. There will be end of Mendelian genetics. We'll just find every single gene. Because there are multiple people with mutation in every single gene compatible with life. Right? We'll just find them all. A uh, little bit of stories, right? So this, these are new findings. So you look at, I know that we're, we have a couple of people with, with medical background, so you can see uh, and decide whether you agree or disagree with our clinical variation. But we pretty much believe it's uh, this, this individuals uh, have the same, uh, relatively the same uh, phenotype and fit, uh, fit, uh, fit the gene. Uh, okay, this is the story about the novos. Now I have to go quickly because I'm running out of time in my, in my stupid habit here. Um, so again, what's happening here is you can run statistics on this case because in compound heterozygosity you, you have two variants. Right? What is the chance that two variants of certain score would land on the same gene? Those are inherited variants. And one important thing here is that we have whole genomes, not exomes. So we can also look deep in the encoding region. And we haven't had a lot of success finding regulatory variation, but what we find are variants that produce gain of splice site. And these are not your usual splice variant. They, they, they destroy acceptor and donor. 
this is new, right? Appears in the intronic sequence like like Venus coming out of sequel. Right, so this is this is literally what's happening. So you see if suddenly you have a new acceptor or another game. What we use, we use Splice AI, uh, software that's developed by Luna. It's, it's uh, AI type software that predicts these events. We tested how well it works in collaboration with Rich Sherwood in, uh, in the experimental studies, multi uh, massively parallel splice assay. What's good, you don't need patient material, you just put mutations in the measure splicing. Um, uh, this is a quick description of the essay. I think I don't I probably don't have time to go through details here. But that's what's important. So this is how well bioinformatic does versus experimental uh, confirmation. So what you see here, this is machine learning prediction, and this is number of reads supporting acceptor gains and donor gains. And what you see here, there is a pretty good correlation. So we're finding a lot of true signals. The problem, of course, is there are false negatives, right? So we're, we're, we're missing, we're still missing a bunch of signals here. So it's working great, but not extraordinarily, extraordinarily great, right? But this is what we're like. Okay, uh, anyway, uh, so how it works. It works the following way. So we think that most of the uh, most of the thing that determines distribution of variance among the sequences, mutation rate variation, but as I told you yesterday, we know how to model. So we can compute the probability that out of all mutations uh, inherited from mom, one would land in this gene in this site with very high prediction score. I can also uh, uh, compute the probability, the conditional probability that, uh, that score of splicing or score for the coding variant would be above certain, uh, certain value. And I can repeat it from, from, uh, from the depth. So I, I do it once for the mom, repeat it from the, from the depth, and we just take maximum of these two, of, of this two tail probabilities. I, I read a bunch of theoretical paper, there was no proven best way to do it, so we took maximum as a simple one works. Uh, again, a couple examples of diagnosis, same story. These are not returned, single patients, right? You read about this, and this is clearly true finite. Same thing, we just press the buttons, and uh, the, all of the diagnos diagnostics done purely computationally, the slow process, of course, is validation, right? So clinicians should look at the cases, sometimes you run additional workup, you, you may run more volumes and experiment if you wish, but all the discovery is, is done purely computationally on a very heterogeneous code. So this is, uh, okay, for, for the research part of my talk, so the main person is Shilpa Cobran, uh, Zach is PI uh, in chair of the department PI of the uh, Cardenetic Center. Uh, Daniel Shravigli ran on the data. She knew Lee, looked at uh, Sharon Dinova. Uh, Michelle Moldovan is a new postdoc, Molly Daniel for mutation rate. Becky, Julian, and Joel are um, our clinical team, and Rich ran experimental confirmation and the uh, major, uh, major group of UDM. I think I'm just like five, ten minutes over. That's, um, that's it. So it was a heterogeneous mix of stuff. Uh, I hope it wasn't a step off.